let's bring in our guest to discuss this. We have joining us this hour, National Trial Attorney Michael Jaffer with us. Michael, what do you think in terms of the deliberation? Do you think we're going to see a lengthy one, or is it going to be rather short? This was a pretty short trial, just four and a half days of testimony. I'm hoping that the deliberation will be a little bit longer because I really hope that the jury really takes their time and really examines this. We've seen some pretty good juries. I'm hoping that this is another one of them. Um, I'll be honest with you, I love Dr. Andrew Clark. He was my favorite witness, expert witness in a long time, right? I think he's the most likable psychiatrist I've ever seen on the stand ever. And I've seen over a thousand trials where an expert was testifying, right? I think that the defense met their burden. Their burden It's their burden to prove that she was not guilty by reason of insanity, right? They have to prove it. I felt that they've met their burden. I felt like that Dr. Andrew Clark, I mean, what would the jury believe? That Carly Gregg paid him a bunch of money to come into court and lie? He was very convincing and he was very sure that this girl did not appreciate the wrongfulness of what she did and that they met the, 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 the McNaughton standard, right? At the end of the day, every single question that was asked of him, he had an answer. Well, if she had dissociative fugue, why didn't she, you know, why didn't she panic? He explained to them. Medically, you're not going to panic if you don't know that what you did was wrong. If you thought that what you did was wrong, you would panic. But the reason she didn't panic it shows that she was exhibiting a complete disassociative state, disassociative fugue state, right? So I believe that Dr. Andrew Clark helped the defense meet their burden. We'll see what happens. At the end of the day, her father, the victim, testified in her favor. The person she shot, the person on the 911 call that she shot, to, uh, testified that he was speaking to her every day. He clearly, clearly has a relationship with her. He clearly loves this girl, right? And so to me, that is the most, there's the prosecutor who did an excellent job. There's a defense attorney who did an excellent job. There's the witnesses, the, the, the experts who testified did an excellent job. But none of us lived with this girl, but he did. He lived with her. She shot his wife to death and she shot him almost to death, yet he has a relationship with her. For me, that was the tipping point where I said in myself, unless I see, hear something very compelling, by the prosecutor when they cross-examine Dr. Andrew Clark or when they bring up their own experts. Unless I see something very compelling, I I believe that she should be found not guilty by reason of insanity. And one last thing, I've always been in favor of us as a society of, of, of uh, attorneys changing the, the name of the not guilty by insanity defense to guilty, period, insanity proven. I think jurors would have a better time, an easier time checking that box it's very difficult very difficult even if i was on the jury to check not guilty i don't care what's after the comma not guilty by reason of insanity whatever's after the comma not guilty but she's going to go go to jail for a million years it would be very difficult and i can understand that because these are human beings at the end of the day mm -hmm. if that was just called guilty period insanity proven i think it would it would be easier for them but we'll see what happens well, she's a child. Point. Yeah, yes. and you know, this was an interesting case to watch, and we've pointed this out because, you know, not only were they using bits of uh, video and waving around the gun and showing the evidence in the case during closing arguments, but they each took turns. So we heard from all of the attorneys. Now, Michael Jaffer, I wanted to get your opinion on the fact that, uh, you know, attorneys on both ends talked about the penalty phase. We don't usually hear that. Yeah, that was puzzling to me. There was a lot of things in this in this trial that was disorienting to me. I mean, maybe I was just disoriented, watch, disoriented watching this trial because a kid was on trial. But when the attorneys, I've seen some bizarre things lately in some of these trials where in advance of the trial, we'll have a colloquy where it's been looked, sound, it sounds like a sentencing and a person, a trial hasn't even began yet. And the attorneys, when they were talking about the sentencing phase, I think it's because there's a video of her doing exactly what she's admitted, what, what, what everybody knows she did. That was a little bit puzzling to me. I'll be honest with you, Matt. There's always a rhyme and reason. In those closed rooms, in those meetings between, because these prosecutors and these defense attorneys, they all know each other. They're all buddies. They've had many, many, many trials in front of one another, just not many that have been on, on TV. Maybe there was a conversation between them. Maybe they're both trying to find, they're getting, they're looking forward to the sentencing phase. Maybe her defense attorneys know that she's going to get convicted. Maybe they know the jury maybe because they're in the room. But that was a little disorienting for me to see. Mm, well, we will see what this jury comes back with. They've got that verdict form. They are going over it an hour and 38 minutes so far. Michael J. for standby. We do have to squeeze in a break, but we are in Ohio where jury selection. Let's bring in national trial attorney Michael Jaffer to see what he thinks about the timing. Two hours, Michael, that is not a lot of time, even though this was not the longest of trials. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think they came back quick. I think it has, it reads all over it, you know, they are going to convict her normally guilty. I mean, they were in the courtroom. I defer to the wisdom of the jury. Uh, but it, to me, as a defense attorney, I just roll my eyes when I hear that they're done with the verdict. I say, well, with all the evidence, with all the considerations, I don't think you guys are coming back just not guilty by reason of insanity. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I was convinced that they met their burden. Uh, but the, 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 the quickness and speed with which the jury came back on a murder case, uh, to me, it seems like they're going to convict her on all three charges. Get, you know, the murder, attempted murder, and the concealing evidence. That's my thing. That's my, that's my prediction at this point. Uh, and you know what sticks out to us here and you know our producer and we've all been talking about this uh, on the air is those powerful closing arguments that they heard before they went back into that deliberation room including from the state and their main point that they really hammered home early on uh, in their closings was that uh, she knew right from wrong if we can play that and talk about that on the other side. There's no doubt that Carly Madison Gregg is the one who killed her mom, Ashley Smiley. There's no doubt that she attempted to kill he Smiley when she aimed the gun right at his head and shot and hit him in the shoulder. And there's no doubt that she's the one who hid the camera, thus tampering with evidence in the refrigerator. And we would ask you that you go back there and you find her guilty of all three because she was not insane at the time that this happened. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she knew the difference between right and wrong. Prosecutor there, Michael White, really just um, putting it in, in air quotes for this jury that this is what you need to focus on um, from our position and what we've shown you. What do you say, Michael? I did. I did not think he was impactful in in that uh, closing statement because at the end of the day, he was giving conclusions that you know did not make any sense. It, it, there's no doubt. That she, we know that there's no doubt that she killed him. Uh, she did appreciate wrong. Well, uh, based on what the expert testimony that came in that was credible said that she did not understand right from wrong. Her father testified in her favor. She was 14 years old. Her father, her biological father, was treated for bipolar. She was on Zoloft. She was on Lexapro. She got off cold turkey, even though her doctor told her don't get off cold turkey. This was her mom. Her mom loved her. They had a great relationship. So uh, on what basis was that prosecutor saying that he had concluded, hey, she did she did understand right from wrong. She did like uh, based on what, dude, like I was not convinced by that prosecutor. He did what he had to do at the end of the day, um, but I, I was not convinced. I feel like I feel like the burden was pr the burden was proven by the state that she committed the murders and the burden by the defense that she with the clear and convincing evidence that she did not roll right from wrong she was insane at the time i think that was proven that's my opinion um so i don't th i think the prosec the prosecutor when they do these closing statements they're arguing the case of the jury right they're not allowed to make any statements during the trial they can only ask questions and absorb answers and then in the closing statement they a tell you that they pro they delivered on the promises they made in their opening statement and b they tell you how they see the evidence and how they want you the jury to understand the evidence and analyze the evidence that's their right that's what they're supposed to do that's what makes them skilled or not skilled uh but he was just making a bunch of just quid pro quo uh conclusions that in my opinion were not proven by the evidence we are just seeing now our first shots of Carly Gregg walking into the courtroom. As we now all know, the verdict is in, has not been announced yet. We heard Kelly Kraft tell us that the judge was going to give them about 10 minutes to all get together once that verdict was made known. And watch what she does here. We saw this during the trial, during her trial. She touches her heart at one point in mm. time. There it is there. Um, we know that she's been making a lot of communication with the people who are in the gallery. We understand her grandparents have been in the gallery. Her stepdad, Heath Smiley, who we saw testify in this case, we've heard. On her the, behalf. On her, well, you know, as a state witness, but yes, saying things that certainly would have helped this jury believe that she was suffering from a mental illness. He said her eyes were wide open and he didn't recognize what she looked like. So this is Heath Smiley right now. This is live inside of the courtroom, how he is looking in this moment of knowing that a verdict has been reached and under four 
uh, two hours rather after four and a half days of testimony in the case for his stepdaughter. Yeah, he is just a couple feet away from her. This is a very tiny courtroom there, all eyes on this courthouse. And all the parties were told it's going to be read within 10 minutes, so they had to be close by. She is breaking down in tears. I'm seeing on another shot on one of our monitors right now, and he is looking over at her. There's definitely still a very strong connection there. So she has been behind bars since her arrest back in March. Uh, he said on the stand that we talk every day. So no doubt emotional for everyone involved. It looks like he is mouthing things to her and she is reacting to that. Um, I don't want to break away from this moment, but Michael Jaffer, I just want to get your reaction as we watch this video continue. And it looks like the parties may be getting ready to all stand up, which will be our indication that the judges come in. But your thoughts when you're seeing this 15 year old girl. When I was doing cases in juvenile court, this, this breaks my heart to see it because this is what the defendants looked like, but they were in juvenile court, right? I think that they made, I think the defense attorneys, again, I don't know why they did not take the plea. I think they were offered a plea of 40 years. She would have been in her, her mid fifties when she came out. I, it breaks my heart to see it. It's disorienting to see a kid in that situation. We are really close to the verdict being read. We are going to squeeze in a break so that we will be here and ready and you will be able to listen to that verdict come in live. You're watching Court TV.